Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today here. My name is Kirsten Howe. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at Tucson Audubon, and I'm excited to introduce our Director of Engagement Education, Luke Stafford, who will be talking about his recent trip uh, to South Africa for a birding trip with Tucson Audubon and Naturalist Journeys. So I will go ahead and turn it over to him. Cool. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, there's a, a few folks on the call here today who were also on the trip with me. Uh, Sue and Diane, I see you guys for sure. Um, yeah, I'll just say that as I was putting together this presentation, it was a little bit um, difficult to condense 18 to 20 days into a 45 minute presentation. So we'll see what we can do. I know normally when I when I do talks, um, I'll take questions during the presentation. Uh, this time around, we'll wait till the end. Otherwise, it it would take forever, <laughs> but um, uh, hopefully it, it's um, you know, we'll we'll talk about all these adventures that we had in South Africa um, and that we uh, experienced with birding acre tours, and hopefully you get a little bit of taste of what it was like over there. Maybe whet your appetite a bit to go and experience it yourself. Or maybe you've been there before in the past, uh, and it'll bring back some good memories for you. Um, so without further ado, we're going to dig in and um, let me let me start sharing my screen with y'all. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to South Africa before, but it it's um it's like nothing else I've ever experienced. I before going to South Africa, I'd been to Malawi, which is just a little bit north of South Africa, um, and it has some of the same animals uh, but doesn't have like the big cats or like giraffe or um, uh, many of the the birds that we saw so this is a, almost like a, a brand new experience for me as well um, so we uh, went on this tour with a uh, partnership tour with birding eco tours uh, they're uh, a tour company that i met back in 2019 uh, at the san diego bird festival developed a really good friendship and partnership with them. And, um, and so shortly after that, in 2019, we put together this really awesome tour that we we're gonna take all together in 2020. Um, and, you know, it didn't happen in 2020. It finally happened, just, a, uh, just got back from it last week. Um, and so, uh, Dylan Vassapoli, uh, our uh, Virginia Couture's guide, he he was our our guide for the whole trip. He lives in Johannesburg, and um, he was amazing. Holy cow! Um, you know, if you ever get a chance to go birding with Dylan, I would really, really recommend it. Uh, especially in South Africa, he's like, um, I mean, he knows his stuff. He's just so awesome. He's just such a a gentle, uh, great leader, and. Um, so he was our main guide and I just kind of went as a, a kind of an ambassador, kind of a, a second leader, but then also as a participant. So I was right there with Diane, I was right there with Sue and the rest of the participants and just like uh, enjoying all of this. We're there, as you can see here, September 20th through October 10th. So we're there almost three weeks uh, if we're there for both legs. Uh, and really when I say two legs, it was like one tour, in the Western Cape around Cape Town, and then a second tour around Johannesburg and Kruger National Park. Uh, I'll show you. So uh, one really cool thing with eBird is that it puts together these trip reports. And if you can see this right here, you can see we had this big old mess of eBird uh, submissions here around Cape Town, and then way up here in the north east section of South Africa. Oh. Someone could mute themselves. That'd be great. Uh, or Kirsten, if you could find that person and mute them for us. Thank you. So, and then, uh, so let me catch my thought here again after hearing that. So Southwest around Cape Town, we spent about eight or nine days there. And then we moved up into the Northeast section of South Africa, which is around Johannesburg and Kruger National Park, which is right along the Mozambique border. So if we uh, make this map a little bit bigger and you can see here's the second leg we flew into Johannesburg and this is Mozambique here along the Indian Ocean and Kruger National Park is this whole section here. It's a huge natural park. We'll talk about that a little more 
but this is the second leg of our tour. And then uh, our first leg was down the very southwest corner of South Africa here around Cape Town. So you can see a little bit of where we're at. This is where Cape Town is at, the Cape of Good Hope. And then we went up the west coast and then over into the crew. So really two drastically different parts of this tour uh, that we took. And so um, we'll share a little bit about each of those sections uh, as we go on. Let me get back to this. So we're there just recently. So, you know, it's going into early fall for us. They're in the Southern hemisphere. So that's early spring for them. So coming out of winter, coming into spring. And um, so the weather around Cape Town at times was a little chilly, uh, a little bit of wind, a little bit of rain at times. Uh, when we went up into the crew, into the desert part, it was um, warmer. And then when we went over to Johannesburg and Kruger, the weather was a lot like what we experienced here in Tucson, really dry, really dusty, really hot at times. Um, so altogether all in South Africa, there's been 870 species recorded and we saw nearly half of those, which is pretty cool. We ended up with 413 species of birds. No, I'm not gonna show you every single bird that we saw, but let's get into a few of them. So here's our group. Uh, on our first leg, the West Cape leg, um, it was it was a fun crew. This is Dylan, our, our guide, and, and uh, Jim and Bill and Lissa and Judy and Sue, and uh, so it was a small group. There was just um, seven of us all together on the first leg, and this is us in front of a beautiful uh, mural at uh, Strandfontein, uh, Sue's Treatment Ponds. Uh, Visit Sue's Treatment Ponds, whether we're in Tucson or South Africa, those are always the best spots. So, uh, but we don't stay at the Sue's Treatment Ponds. This is where we stayed on the very first night for actually first three or four nights when we flew into Cape Town and ended up at this place called Fernwood Manor. And uh, in the background, you can see Table Mountain. This is like one of the huge iconic geographic features of the Cape Town area, the beautiful Table Mountain. And it was right in the backdrop of where we're staying uh, for the first few nights of our tour. And I forgot to bring my swimsuit, should have brought my swimsuit, but um, beautiful pool. But these, these plants all around just uh, showcase a little bit of the um, plant diversity of South Africa and especially this Cape area. Uh, some of the birds that we saw when we first got into Cape Town just to give you a little idea, like everything was brand new. We get in, it was like, holy cow, I'm hearing all these brand new uh, songs. I've seen all these brand new birds. How do I digest all of this? And so like for all of us, really, when we get placed in a brand new location, you just start with uh, what's in front of you. So you just get to know the really common birds first. It's like one of the main things, uh, takeaways that all of us should really hold on to when we go somewhere new. It's just don't try to get everything, just focus on those things that are right in front of you. So two of the most common birds that we had were Cape Bulbul um, and then Cape White Eye, which is really cool. Both of them have these like really cool white eye rings. Not really sure why both of them do, but, but like these were the common ones with those really awesome white eye rings. And uh, they're all around. We had them every day during this leg of the tour. And uh, you can see they, they really love this, this bottle brush bush. And um, so those are typical ones that we had, um, but really in Cape Town, what's, what's a big thing in Cape Town is, is the penguins, um, the African penguins. So like I had never seen African, I, I had never seen penguins before. So this is like a whole new bird family, the start of what would be so many different new bird families that I had never seen before that we don't have here uh, in the Tucson area or even you know anywhere in the United States. It's all about the penguins. And so these African penguins were, um, were all over this one beach that we went to. We went to a place called Boulders Beach. And um, just there, I mean, I think I put 250 African penguins on my uh, Eber list. It could have been probably many more than that. Um, 
but they were all over the place. And so they had these signs, penguins will bite, don't mess around with them because they're like right next to you. You can see right here, here's the, uh, actually I'm gonna stop my share because I wanna put the, the sound on. I forgot to do the, do the sound. So let me do that. Let me go back to share sound. All right, there we go. So you can see here's the pathway that we we're on and the penguins are like right next to it. Um, if you go, if I go to the next slide here, you can see this is like right next to the, the boardwalk as well, these artificial burrows. So penguins uh, nest in burrows, right? And so they definitely have some natural burrows that they've made here at this Boulders Beach area, but um, they've also put in artificial burrows so that um, for just so, just like what we do with Lucy's warbler boxes, you know, they put these burrows in there so that they can thrive and they can do well. I was kind of imagining what Tucson Audubon would be like if it was in Cape Town. So instead of uh, making Lucy's warbler boxes and handing those out to people, we'd figure out ways to put artificial burrows in for penguins. So like, I was just thinking like all these different, I was seeing like invasive plants and I was seeing these artificial burrows and I was thinking, oh, Tucson Audubon would fit right in here with all these different things. But this is like right next to the boardwalk and I'm um, gonna we'll play this, um, this a little video. The penguin doesn't do much, but in the background, you're gonna hear uh, penguins making their, their noise. So kind of take in a little bit of what uh, the, what we're hearing and experiencing when we're seeing these African penguins. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear specifically what they sound like, but they're called also, instead of African penguins, they're also sometimes called jackass penguins because they sound like donkeys. So uh, let me just play it again. It's easy to hear the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was pretty fun. Uh, the, it was so loud. It actually smelled so bad as we walked through there because there is like, as you can see, like in, around the artificial burrows, there's all this poop and everything. So it smelled bad. I was hearing donkeys everywhere and penguins were right there in front of us. It was pretty, pretty surreal, pretty amazing. Here's a um, penguin chick. I just had to throw this in there. It's just kind of really cute. But there's nothing like seeing penguins all around. And then, um, and then from the penguin area, we went and to the very uh, point of of uh, the Cape Town area, which is the Cape of Good Hope. And so this is looking out over the Cape of Good Hope. And um, for some of us, if we're history bus, we think of like uh, I think it's Vasco da Gama who sailed around the tip of South Africa and. Um, you know, created this continuity between Europe and Asia and sailing around the, the Cape. And so it's just like so much history right there. But this whole area around the Cape of Good Hope, um, there is plenty of birds. And so some of the birds that we had were called sunbirds. Uh, sunbirds reminded me a lot of our hummingbirds. You know, there's no hummingbirds in Africa, but there are plenty of sunbirds. Here's uh, a couple malachite sunbirds. It's beautiful dark green and black sunbird. Um, they have these cool bills that are kind of curved. Here's an orange breasted sunbird. All throughout our time in South Africa, not just on the Cape, uh, but all throughout we had all these different types of sunbirds. And it's just a couple, couple types that we had, but they really stood out to me, beautiful sunbirds. Uh, also while we're at the Cape, um, we walked up, to this point where we could kind of look out everywhere. And that's where I took that previous picture of the Cape of Good Hope. But there was baboons up there. And uh, this specific baboon uh, really scared a couple of us who were on the trip. Uh, we were walking back down the trail and this baboon um, like let out this huge yell. It sounded like a man like yelling, but it was a baboon. 
And one of the participants was like, what is that? And I was like, I think that's a baboon. Like we need to, don't stop, let's keep going. And so we were walking down and it was kind of a, a tight trail. And then all of a sudden I look back behind us and there's this huge baboon that looks small in this picture. But this baboon was huge and it was rolling, I don't know, not rolling, but I mean, it just, it looked like it was rolling down this trail right behind us on the right side of the trail. I was on the left side, a couple uh, other tour people were on the, on the right side. I was like, go left, go left. And uh, thankfully they didn't even look back, uh, Judy and Lisa, they just uh, kind of listened to me and moved to the left and this huge baboon just like went right by us. I thought for sure it was gonna take Judy out, but it didn't. Uh, so I just had to throw that little baboon story in there. Uh, you never know what these guys are going to do. Um, kind of have to be careful, kind of like Javelina, I guess. But the real big part of this whole uh, part of being out on uh, the Cape of Good Hope, for me anyways, was we went down into this area near the beach uh, along the, the Cape, and there were ostriches there. If you've never, like, you may have seen ostriches in the zoo or something like that. But I tell you what, it's nothing like seeing an ostrich in the wild for the very first time. I was just like blown away. Um, this is an uh, ostrich that we saw. I took this picture with just my um, my my phone, and it was just it was just like right there. And it was like one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. But to see an ostrich out in the wild, it was it's just uh, amazing. Um, it's an experience that I, I would. I, the only other thing I could really compare it to was maybe seeing elephant for the first time or when I saw a giraffe for the first time at Kruger later on during this trip. It was just like amazing. Um, but these ostriches were out in this really cool hab habitat called the Fainbos, and um, it was amazing. So uh, part of this first part of um, uh, the Cape Town, West Cape experience was going out on a plastic trip. And so that means going about 30, 40 miles out into the ocean. This is the Atlantic Ocean, kind of where it starts to meet the Indian Ocean. And um, on this pretty, for me, a pretty small boat, but this is a little video, a little experience, what it was like to be out on that boat and looking at albatrosses and petrels. I'm going to play this video here. I tell you, this is my second plagic I've ever been on. Definitely the smallest boat I've ever been on out in the ocean. A little bit nerve wracking for me. I'm not really a sea person, but it was breathtaking to be around all these albatrosses and petrels. Uh, two, the, we saw two different types of albatross. The white capped or the shy albatross, as it's also known. Uh, this picture, I didn't quite get the tip of the wing in there is almost an epic shot but I just missed a little portion of that wing up there on the top but they were like flying right next to us this wasn't like zoomed in or anything um here's a black browed albatross um they're fairly similar looking but so like as we were learning these like because we don't we don't see albatrosses very often here so like I'm really trying to figure out all right how do I tell these apart well, you can see the underwing, the underwing on the white capped, really light underneath and underneath of the black brown, really dark. So that, that really helped me. The most common species we had out there was white chin petrel. There's thousands of white chin petrels all around us. Um, we also saw a spectacled petrel, which is kind of similar to this. I don't have a good picture of it, but it, that was kind of a rare one that we saw. Um, and sooty shearwaters and um, gannets and uh, brown skuas. It was, again, another experience that never would have here in the Tucson area. So moving on from the Plagic, because I can only stay on, the, on that area so long, we've got to get to all this other stuff. Um, one of the cool things about South Africa, and especially this Cape leg of the tour, was how many endemic birds there are how many 
endemic species, which means that they're only found right there in South Africa. Like you can't find them anywhere else. And in South Africa, there's 69 endemic species. And we saw, um, well, I, I, it's all blocked for me. I think it was 47 species that we saw of these 69 endemic. One of them that we had was Cape Rock Jumper. Now Cape Rock Jumper, uh, and I'll show you, um, I think I have it pulled up here. All right, let's go to that, boom. Okay, so this is, you saw my picture of Cape Rock Jumper. Here is um, a legit Cape Rock Jumper picture right here. This is what it looked like. And uh, just to give you an idea of, of the map of where they're located, you can see here, just this is all the purple is where Cape Rock Jumpers have ever been seen or recorded before in Ebert. You can see mostly right here in the Cape Town area. In fact, this dark purple right here is where we had uh, the rock jumpers, a place called Ruyels. So this section right here is, is where the Cape of Good Hope is and where we saw the penguins and where we went out on our plagic. And then over here is where we went for these Cape rock jumpers. Let me get back out of this, but just want to give you an idea of, of how rare these birds are and just like how, um, specific they are to this type of, uh, this place and this habitat. Um, so this Cape Rock Jumper is specific to this area, this habitat called Fainbos. And uh, here we are walking along where we had the Cape Rock Jumper. You can see it's, it looks pretty barren. It's very rocky there where the rock jumpers are at. Uh, and then it just has like some different grasses and these uh, plants with these flowers. Those are called protea. Uh, protea plants. And here's another example of where Dylan's talking to us about this special habitat called Famos. And you can see these, this area a little bit, um, a little bit denser, a little bit taller of uh, plant life. So sometimes the Famos can be, um, you know, short, but sometimes it can be, this, this is about as tall as it gets with these big old uh, protea plants. Um, but the like some of those sunbirds I showed you before, like orange breasted sunbird, uh, Cape Rock Jumper, Malachi Sunbird, this is the only stuff that they're in. So it's really specific habitat. So it's really specific birds. And that's one of the real um, key takeaways that I had from my experience in South Africa it was just like the habitat was so specific. And so there was just really specific birds and wildlife that we could see in those areas. Here's another picture of Famos and another endemic species that we had. This is the Southern Black Corhon, kind of like a bustard, or kind of like a, like a, like a really big grouse or something like that. And um, this is like right alongside the road and got a, a video of it uh, calling for my camera. So I'm gonna play that right here. Really cool call that this Black Corhon uh, gives. So let me. Do this. So that first little clicking you heard was uh, probably Bill Ypsilanzas taking pictures with this camera, but the second part was the Goron calling. Uh, such a cool call. I remember this experience like it, like it was right there, right in front of us. And this Fainbos is just so cool how it, it just holds these really special birds. Here's another one, a southern double colored sunbird. This is the same area where we had the Cape Rock Jumper, another endemic species. And uh, we just had these endemic species all throughout the tour, but especially on the Cape Lake. So from the Cape, we went up uh, around the West Coast and had a bunch of flamingos and a whole bunch of other cool birds. And then we went into the crew, which is kind of like, as you can see, our desert. Another really specific habitat that you won't find anywhere else. And uh, they call it the crew. Uh, just really barren and open. We spent uh, a couple of days in this habitat and you might think that, wow, there's nothing there. There's hardly any birds. But um, just to give you an example, uh, for one day here in the crew, we had, this is just one portion of our day. We had 49 species. We had 
Nemocle sand grouse, we had African harrier hawks, we had booted eagles, red-faced mouse birds, pied barbets, uh, the lots of different larks. It was amazing. Like uh, other birds, like aramomalas. Anyone heard of an aramomala before? But we had two species of aramomalas. Like it's just amazing how something so barren like this just holds so many different species. Um, it was, it was, it was amazing. Here's a fairy flycatcher that we had right at the lodge that we were at. Um, Namakwa dove, uh, one of the most beautiful doves that I've ever seen. Um, we definitely had a lot of regular doves like red-eyed dove and African morning dove that looked a lot like the doves that we have, but uh, Namakwa dove just really stood out, it was amazing. So one bird that we tried to look for and spent uh, a good half hour just kind of waiting to see if it would show up for us was a red-chested fluff tail. <laughs> Probably again, a bird that you may not have ever heard of before. I'm gonna show you, let's see if we can bring up a, uh, a picture of red-chested fluff tail. Now, we didn't get to see this. We tried really hard. And it was a pretty cool experience. Uh, this is what a red chested fluff tail looks like. It's uh, smaller than a Sora, just bigger than a mouse, uh, evidently. We didn't see it, uh, but that's what it looks like. And this is the area that we were looking. So this is in the Karoo area, and there's this little marsh. And you can see um, there's like a little trail that's made right there, and a little trail that's made right there. So uh, Dylan made these little trails and um, for the fluff tail to possibly come in to these areas so that we could see it. But unfortunately it did, but we did hear it. It's got a really cool call. So I just wanted to play the call for you. because This is a bird that we really want to see, but didn't. But it was cool enough to just hear it. This is what it sounded like. Anyways, it, it was it was really neat. Um, even though we didn't get to see it, uh, and just the experience of what it's like to try and see one was was awesome. And it just Dylan did a great job of helping us try to, to find that. So I think I'm doing good. It's like 11:30, so I was planning on spending 30 minutes on the Cape leg, and I did it. I can't believe it. Uh, so that means I get 30 minutes for Kruger as well. Uh, so we ended our Cape Leg at Strand Fontaine, which is a waterworks area, which uh, they call their sewage treatment pond areas waterworks. Um, and so we went to the Strand Fontaine waterworks and had greater flamingos. We had Cape shovelers. We had red knob coots. Uh, just, I don't know about you, but I love going to sewage treatment ponds and seeing all these amazing water birds, like one of my favorite things in the world, but I had never ever seen flamingos at a sewage treatment pond before, my first experience. And uh, we had greater, we also had lesser flamingos as well. They weren't as close to us, but they were there. We had Malachite Kingfisher. Again, it was a great way to end our, our Cape portion of the trip with a bird species list of 60 plus at Strand Fontaine and uh, just a great way of, of ending that, that tour. Um, so a little food interruption before we, um, before we go to the Kruger Park, because you know, food is important. And what kind of food did we have on the tour? Well, a lot of it was really similar to what we have here. I mean, we had ate out for dinner, every night. This is a normal dinner that I had, of course. People are giving me a bad time. Do you ever eat anything besides burgers? But not very often. Um, but what, this uh, barbecue sauce right here, they don't call it barbecue sauce in South Africa. Uh, does anyone know what they call it in South Africa? All right, I'm going to assume no one does. It's called monkey gland sauce monkey gland sauce and I saw it 
on the menu. And I was like, Dylan, what is monkey gland sauce? And he said, oh, you'll just have to try it. So I ordered the monkey gland sauce with my onion rings and burger, and it was great. <laughs> but it's barbecue sauce. It doesn't really come from monkeys, just what they call it. Um, they also, the beer selection wasn't great the whole time we were there. They have, um, they don't have all the wonderful IPAs and all the uh, really good beers that we have here, but they, you know, um, I think, uh, yeah, Castle Light, Black Label. But then one day I also ordered a cream soda. And it was the weirdest thing. I just had to take a picture of this cream soda that I had. I'd never had a neon green cream soda before, uh, but that's how it came out. Um, so a little bit there. Also for food. Now this isn't like breakfast or lunch or dinner or anything like that, but just about every mid morning, we would take a break and have coffee and tea and um, little cookies, little, um, oh, what do they call them in, in England? Um, biscuits, right? So um, every morning Dylan would make us some coffee, make us some tea and we enjoy it out of the back of the van. It was a wonderful experience. The most wonderful experience is when he had some more of these eat some mores. So these were like the best thing, the best shortbread biscuits that I've ever had in my life. And uh, I think Diane and Sue might agree with me. I know you guys are here, like you can chime in if you want, just how good those were. Um, but that was one of the <laughs> most surprising, amazing parts of the trip was just taking a little break from birding enjoying some coffee and tea and some eat some more shortbread biscuits. Um, it was it was wonderful. So that's my little food break. Um, breakfast was amazing. Every morning we'd almost always have bacon and sausage and eggs and yogurt and everything at the different lodges that we we're staying at. But let's move into uh, more birds and animals. I haven't showed you very many pictures of mammals yet, but we're going to get to those here pretty soon when we get to Kruger. So uh, we hopped on a plane from Cape Town to Johannesburg because it's a 14-hour drive. Um, by the way, the, the infrastructure in South Africa is, a, is great. It's just like the United States. It's just like easy to get around, uh, but it would have been a 14-hour drive to get to Johannesburg. So we hopped on the plane, maybe about a, like a flight from Tucson to Denver away. And I got there, uh, Bill went back to the States and we picked up Diane and Suzanne. And so there was uh, seven of us for this portion of the tour. And here's us at our final destination, the Zenzele River Lodge. Um, so looking chipper even at the end of the tour. Uh, but we started by going to another kind of waterworks area uh, called Bullfrog Pan. And I just had to throw in some more water birds to start off this leg. Uh, Red Bishop, uh, there's a couple different, the bishops kind of reminded me of like kind of our blackbirds, like red wing blackbirds. Mm -hmm. uh, Red Bishop, Squawk O'Heron, Makoa Duck, just it's amazing how many new species there are um, and how they always kind of remind me, or not always, but many times remind me of a bird species that we would see here in the state. So, of course, what do you think of when you see a Makoa duck? Think of a ruddy duck, right? Ruddy duck. So, very similar to ruddy duck. And so, like, that helped me to kind of think about, all right, what am I looking for in these birds? How do I identify them? And um, so I kind of compared them a little bit to the birds that we had here. So when I see a squawk heron, kind of heavy body, kind of remind me of a a benight heron or a green heron kind of in between mm -hmm. that. Um, just made me think about how I identify birds here in Tucson as well as there, thinking about some of those different structure, structural parts. And um, it was an interesting uh, challenge for me. And um, I think enables, it helps me be a better bird here as well as in South Africa. So we started off with a big old list of bullfrog pan and then, um, oh, yes, here. I did that. For the, yes. Um, for, the, for Sue and Diane, 
we had Hadada ibises every day. It was the only bird that we had every day during the tour. Um, our guide, Dylan, always picked on Hadada ibis as being the most annoying, annoying bird in all of South Africa. And so I have a little video of Hadada ibis. This is what it actually looks like right there. Kind of a dumpy, like Dylan would describe it as dumpy, kind of ugly, loud, annoying bird. Here's what they sound like. So even when there's just like one or two Hadada Ibis, you'd be waking up in the morning hearing this and think there's like 500 Hadada Ibis outside of my, my little room that I'm staying. Uh, nope. Uh, it's just one or two, and they're just like so loud in your face all the time. Every habitat, they're there. It was a constant throughout the whole um, throughout the whole tour. And so sometimes it's it's good to have those constants. And by, by the end of the tour, we actually were trying our hardest to make sure we had Hadada Ibis on our on our list for the day. But I had to make sure to throw that in there as another kind of water bird. But you know, they're in every type of habitat that we go to. So we went from the bullfrog pan, which is right there in Johannesburg, and the next day we drove to a place called Dolstrom. Dolstrom is up in the mountains, a uh, high elevation. So like, um, I think like it, it, I think it ended up being like mm, seven thousand foot elevation, kind of around there. So pretty pretty high up there. Johannesburg is like uh, like Denver, like uh, like a mile. 5,000, 5, feet elevation. And so we moved up to Dolstrom and we went to this lake. You can't see the lake down here, but the lake is down here. And we we're look, looking up into the, the, these cliffs. And, and Dylan said, this is the spot where we might have Cape Eagle Owl. So we're going to stay here. And we're going to listen for Cape Eagle Owl once sunset comes and maybe we will hear one and so I was I took that as all right if we're gonna maybe hear one at sunset we might see one now because who knows there's probably one up there somewhere I'll start glassing and just all right maybe we'll come across something kind of like needle in a haystack sort of thing and so you look up on this cliff where are you going to start looking if you're looking up on this cliff. Just think about it. I'm going to put a circle where I started looking. Here's the circle. Boom. Right there. Oh. Like, there's this little dark spot right there. I'll bet you an owl would love to be there. Or if not an owl, maybe some sort of critter or something like right there in that little, that little crevice. So I started looking in that crevice with my binoculars. And sure enough, whoa, there's the bird. And it just like zoomed in and we got the scope on there. And sure enough, Cape Eagle Owl right there, right in front of us for us, for all of us to see, even before I started calling. And so we just sat with this bird. I, I felt like it was an hour. Maybe it wasn't an hour, but we sat with it long enough to where it started calling and we're able to look through the scope and see it just like bellow and call. And then about a couple seconds later, we'd actually hear it. That's how far away we were from it. And so we were listening to it and watching it. And then all of a sudden, another, its mate called from somewhere else, and we were able to spot that one. And so we had two Cape Eagle owls, super rare owl, uh, right there in front of us. Uh, it was an amazing experience, and we just got to sit with it for a long time, uh, while other birds were all around us as well, too. It was a pretty neat experience. This is the area, this is the lodge, a uh, little room that we stayed at in Dolstrom, the Linger Longer uh, Country Retreat. And we had these different houses all set up around. Uh, just a wonderful name, the Linger Longer. Like, I wish we could have stayed there longer, but we were just there for one night. Uh, but it overlooked this valley uh, and these ponds where uh, we had these long-tailed widow birds and all sorts of cool stuff. and. Uh, Natal uh, spurfowl running around. 
Um, but it was a beautiful area that we stayed at. And um, uh, we saw some more endemic species. You can see this is uh, a pro protea uh, plant. It has these big flowers on it. And one of the uh, special birds that the protea plants attract is sugar, sugar bird. bird. And this is, the, this is the Gurney sugar bird. So we had two different sugar birds. We had Cape sugar bird uh, on the Cape leg, and then we had Gurney sugar bird on this Johannesburg Kruger section of the tour. Really the only spot in the whole world where you can find Gurney sugar bird. And, and there he was sitting right on top of a protea plant. Uh, it was, again, pretty special. So we went from uh, the Linger Longer Dolstrom area, and we continued up. This is called the escarpment, so like this really uh, high elevation part of South Africa. And we continued on the escarpment down to this um, a different type of habitat that was more like tropical rainforest. And this is Mount Sheba. And so these were the different lodges that we stayed at Mount Sheba. And then this is like dense uh, forest area. This is what, what it looked like to be walking in the forested areas around Mount Sheba. Tall trees, so like we've drastically moved on from the fame boats and moved on to something totally different. And we we're looking for the lone African trogan. So just like we have trogans here, Africa has one trogan. It's called the Narina trogan. And so we're looking and listening for these trogans on this uh, road and sure, excuse me, sure enough, we had Narina trogans. And you know what they look like? They look really similar to our elegant trogans. So this is a poor picture. This is, I, yeah, I tried my best with my camera, but this is the picture I got of Narina trogan. You can see it. It's fairly similar to elegant trogan. Sounds fairly similar to elegant trogan as well, but it's a brand new bird. It was so cool. And we heard a lot. We saw a few. And um, just like our elegant trogans, it's so difficult to find these guys because they, they fly in just like our trogans. And you would think with how big they are and how colorful they are that they would stand out. But again, just so difficult. But I think everyone in our group uh, eventually were able to see these trogans. And it was, yeah, quite the experience. All right, so now we're going to move into Kruger. Um, we got to spend some time here at Kruger National Park. We spent about, I think it was uh, six days, six days in the Kruger area. And so just to give you a little overview of what Kruger National Park is like, it's just a little bit smaller than Pima County. You know, Pima County is huge. Pima County is 901 or 9,100 uh, square miles. Kruger is about 7,500 square miles. So I think, uh, you know, it's bigger in Massachusetts. It's, it's a pretty big area, right? Um, about 500 bird species recorded there. It gets 1.4 million visitors annually. There's a lot of people there. It was during the holiday season. So like there was a lot of people there, but there was just so many amazing animals and birds. I wish we could have spent like another month there. We wouldn't have even exhausted everything. But one of the most amazing experiences when we first got into Kruger, it was not the first mammal we saw. We saw some Cape buffaloes, we saw some other things. But when we had a giraffe right in front of us, it just blew my mind how it towered over the, um, the trees, the acacia trees. It was just incredible. There's nothing like seeing a giraffe. And I kept on, I'll be honest, like I probably said, there's nothing like this, like so many different times with all these other animals that we saw too. <laughs> so I know Sue, her favorite experience during the whole tour was seeing African wild dogs. So here's a, a short little video of African wild dogs. It went like right next to us. So these African wild dogs went by us when we we're in the tour van. The open, like, open tour van, like, you know, there was nothing blocking us with our view at all. Like, it was just right there. And so these wild dogs went by us, and we, our driver did a U-turn, and we followed them. And we followed them for a long ways, like, just watching them and 
I didn't put the picture. Maybe I should have. I this. I, I got so many cool pictures of these wild dogs. Like I could have done a whole. I think between Sue and I, we could have done like a whole section just on wild, a whole presentation just on the wild dogs. It was such a cool experience right off the bat. This is our first morning at Kruger. Uh, it's a really rare experience to see these wild dogs, but there's so many other mammals that we saw. Spotted hyena, it's actually one of my favorites we had. So like our first day was kind of like a wild dog and rhinoceros day. After we saw the wild dogs, we went in search of rhinoceros and found some rhinoceros. Um, actually ended up with quite a few rhinoceroses. Um, and then the next day was kind of like the hyena day. We had so many hyenas. Uh, this is uh, the only type that we had, spotted hyena. Here's a spotted hyena cub. Um, and so the last day we were there, we came across a den of spotted hyenas. And so all these different cubs of different ages were all around. And this kind of looked like a little runt to me. Um, as cute as a hyena can get. Uh, but you could see their jaws. You could just see it just like, oh man, such a crazy looking animal in between. Like not, didn't really give a dog-like impression. Definitely, you know, not cat, almost bear-like a little bit as it kind of walked around. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. So spotted hyenas, elephants, I can't tell you how many pictures of elephants I got. Uh, this is uh, this reminded me of kind of like a interaction between me and my son. Like kind of they they were kind of messing around with each other. This big bull elephant with this younger elephant, and just this younger elephant was like kind of harassing this bigger elephant. Just kind of really reminded me of my son and how he would come and attack me and just like. The bigger elephant, of course, has the upper hand, the upper trunk here. Uh, we also had lions. We had quite a few lions, actually. Uh, some closer than others. Actually, one of the nights we did a, a night drive, and we had lions actually right next to us. Like, literally, we're in this open van type thing, big, big van. And um, nothing separating me from a lion, which is probably 15 feet from me, other than a little bit of canvas. It was a little bit unnerving. Um, I remember I was sitting next to Judy and she wanted to switch spots. So I sat, <laughs> she <laughs> sat on the, the, the inside while I sat on the outside. And um, what it was like, uh, these lions are much bigger than you think. And um, beautiful, beautiful lions. Um, maybe not as beautiful, but we had uh, a bunch of hippos. Most, most of them were in the water. Uh, a few of them, like this one, out in the open. So you can see just like its girth uh, and just, just kind of interesting. Look, look how small the ears are. Like what a strange animal. It was like, oh, so strange. And then Maybe the rarest uh, mammal that we saw, the coolest sighting was a leopard. And this was, again, fairly close to the road. We really lucked into it. There was, um, we we're driving between do two different camps, between Skukuza and Satara camp. And uh, we came across this car that was uh, on the side of the road. Look, we could tell they were looking at something. We were like, hey, what are you looking at? And they're like, look right here. There's a leopard right here. And sure enough, there was a leopard right there. And um, it was it was uh, breathtaking. And so we sat with it for quite a while and watch it sleep a little bit, watch it get up, watch it lay back down. Um, but a leopard right there in front of us. Um, we also had birds. <laughs> we had birds at Kruger National Park too. Not just animals. I, I could show you more animals of like all the different things that we saw. But did you, you know, you probably know that there's a, a big five, right? Of mammals. There's the big five is lion, leopard, 
elephant, rhinoceros, and there's another one. Now I can't remember what the other one was. And the giraffe? fifth one. Uh, no, not giraffe. It's something else. Uh, buffalo. Lion, yeah. Yes, African buffalo. Okay, Cape buffalo. Thank you so much. Cape buffalo, lion, leopard, elephant, rhinoceros. That's that's a big five for mammals. Well, there's also a, a, a big six. Now, the big six, one of them is this guy, the southern ground hornbill. And one of the participants, Melissa, she found these hornbills. She was like, we were looking at something else. I can't remember what it was. And she was like, I think there's a black and red bird out there. What's that black and red bird? And so um, thankfully we didn't dismiss her seeing this. So we backed up and we were like, oh, there really is a black and red bird back there. And all of a sudden, like these southern ground hornbills, you can see that they're, this one's on the ground and they just kind of started walking through. And we had a group of like four or five of these really awkward looking, huge ground dwelling hornbills that walked by us. Uh, we saw, I think maybe three or four other little groups of these throughout the time that we were there. Um, but definitely one of the big six, like one that's um, really um, anticipated and wanted by any birding group that's going out to, uh, to Africa. They want to see a southern ground hornbill. So we, we were able to see these guys. Um, and they're kind of, you know, as they walk along, they eat lizards and they eat like other uh, big grasshoppers and other things that they find as they walk along the ground here. So here's another one of the big six. This is a, a saddle-billed stork. And um, I think we saw him just not too long after we saw our first southern ground hornbills. Uh, but a beautiful stork. I think we only saw a couple of these throughout the whole tour. Uh, this is our first one. Really interesting mark. I'm not really sure what to make of the, this mark on their chest. I'll have to, I should have looked into that. But it's kind of prominent, but the bill, the bill is just really cool and saying it. Um, I believe they're also endangered. So uh, many of these birds that we'll show here as part of the big six uh, are threatened or vulnerable or endangered. And uh, this is a, one, of, one of the many storks that you can see out there. We've had woolly neck stork, open billed stork, yellow billed stork, and then this saddle billed stork, which is one of the big six. Another one of the big six that we we tried almost a whole day to look for, and we finally found them uh, kind of later in the day. But Cory Bustard, Cory Bustard was probably the bird that I wanted to see the most when we were at Kruger, and I I was like almost getting disappointed because we hadn't seen any, and I was like straining my eyes. I think I was just like blowing up my eyes trying to find this bird, and we ended up seeing five of them along this stretch of road um, on one of the last days that we were there. Uh, Corey Bussard is the heaviest flying bird in all the world. So um, it's, as you can see here, it's, it's got these long legs, heavy body, and they do fly. Um, uh, we got great looks at Corey Buster that ended up walking along the road for a little bit, and walking on either side of us. Um, but just an amazing bird. There's a lot of diff different bustards that um, showed you the southern black torhan earlier. That's a type of a bustard as well. And we had um, crew bustard, and then we had, I think, black bellied bustard as well. Uh, but this guy is the biggest, the quarry bustard. Um, the final member of the big six that we saw, we did miss a couple of the big six. We missed um, Pell's fishing owl, which really can't be seen in the Kruger area. And then um, all of us, except for Suzanne and Dylan, saw they saw lappet face vulture. We missed lap, many, most of us missed lappet face vulture. But we did end up seeing this other member of the big six, the Marshall Eagle. We saw it numerous times throughout our time there and had some really close encounters with it, both flying and perched. Here we had it perched. Um, 
just an amazing eagle, powerful. They'll take, um, they'll take and kill Corey Busters. That's how big martial eagles are. They'll prey on something as big as a Corey Buster. They'll take uh, little impalas. They will, they will take some big, uh, some big animals for food. Uh, but Marshall Eagle was really incredible. So there were plenty of other new birds in this area. One of them uh, that really stood out to me was called Aeromark Babbler. Just like another example of a family of birds that we don't have here in North America, uh, babblers, and just like their name suggests, they are very, very vocal. I should have put a vocalization in here for you, but they are uh, really, really vocal. And they get in these groups and kind of start vocalizing together in these big groups, family groups. Um, but one of my favorite birds that I saw there, really, I think, underrated. Here's a, another hornbill we had, uh, along with the southern ground hornbill. We also had the yellow-billed hornbill, like this guy. We had red -billed, southern red-billed hornbill. We had trumpeter hornbill. And we had um, another one. Oh, I can't. I want to say not colored hornbill. It was something else. Another hornbill. <laughs> anyway, um, but we had a lot of different hornbills and um, also very vocal, kind of in your face a little bit. It kind of reminded me of, of um, toucans. That's like the impression that I got. Um, but just so, so cool. Um, need to see these. So after Kruger National Park, our last main stop for the tour was at a place called Zenzele River Lodge. This is what it looked like. It was a fantastic way to end our tour. Beautiful. We had striated heron right here. We had three ring plover. We had um, so many cool birds <laughs> right through this area. It was just a, a beautiful uh, setting. Uh, one group of birds that I haven't brought up yet that we had right here at the Zenzele River Lodge was weavers. So here we had redheaded weavers and this is uh, a male redheaded weaver working on its nest. And uh, if you've never experienced weavers before, Here's a picture. You can see all these little um, weaver nests all over in this tree. And they'll do this in trees. They'll do this in, um, in reeds and cattails. And they'll have these big areas where they make all these different nests and constantly, constantly working on them and weaving together branches and reeds and leaves and all sorts of stuff into this really intricate nest. And what's cool is that the male will make a whole bunch of these nests and the female will come and check it out to see if she likes it or not. And if she doesn't like it, then she'll kind of remove it. She'll uh, tear it apart and you'll see all these different branches and reeds and stuff torn apart on the ground underneath of where the female is like, I don't like this nest, I'll tear it apart but I do like this one and they use that nest. So that's why they make so many different nests because not all of them are used. Um, but this is, this is probably the, um, the weaver that stood out to me the most. Um, Red-headed weaver, beautiful bird. Let's see. So I did it in, in an hour. I just hit the tip of the iceberg for all this, but we had 18 days in South Africa. We had 413 bird species, almost half of all the bird species seen ever seen in South Africa. We had 135 eBird checklists that were submitted. My thumbs were getting burned out from how many checklists I was making throughout the whole trip. You think of that 18 days, 135 checklists. I'm not great with math, but it's quite a few checklists per day. We had 49 mammal species. 16 reptiles, including three different snakes. I didn't even get to, let me talk a little bit about the snakes that we had. I don't have pictures, but um, 
we had three different types of snakes. We had two different African rock pythons, which were both up in trees. Kind of hard to see a couple of them, but um, uh, the, the pythons were huge. And then also up in the tree, we found a, a boom sling, which is a pretty venomous um, uh, snake. And um, the way that we found it is we had all these birds that were like kind of like making a ruckus and kind of in this tree. And Dylan was like, wow, maybe there's a snake up in that tree. And so we were all like looking intently into this really dense tree. And then I think it was Sue. I think Sue said, hey, I think I see something kind of shiny in there, something black. And sure enough, we we're able to find that there was a, a boom sling that all these birds were going after. And, um, and then the last species of snake that we had was a Mozambique spitting cobra. And uh, it was right in the camp at Satara camp in Kruger. And we were having breakfast out there. It was our last morning for breakfast. And uh, many of us had just gone to go look at the African scops owl that was roosting right there in the camp. And then all of a sudden, uh, someone, I think it was Dylan, like, was like, hey, come on over here, come on over here. And there was a cobra that was right there, kind of in this open area in between where people were eating breakfast, uh, Mozambique spitting cobra. And uh, what they do is, just like their name suggests, they spit their venom and they aim for the eyes. So you just have to be really careful around these cobras. We kind of kept up a view of where this cobra was at while we were enjoying our, our omelets and our sausage and our uh, yogurt and granola. Um, so I don't know if any of you have ever enjoyed breakfast next to a cobra, but we did. So that was really cool. One of the many memories that we had. Um, I'm going to quit talking for a little while. Maybe some of you have some questions or some thoughts that you want to bring up, but I think we'll have a, a little bit of time for questions. Um, Thanks for uh, experiencing this with us in, in this uh, virtual way. It's kind of fun. Thanks, Luke. That was uh, incredible. I mean, the photos and the food and the stories. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we did have a couple of questions in the chat. One was about if you saw any secretary birds, which I know that you did. If you could talk yes, about yes, that. yes, 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 yes. Um, so the other thing that I really want to see there was a cheetah which we did miss out on. That was like one of the one of the few mammals that we missed out on. But we did see secretary bird. And actually, um, I think, let me see if I can bring up the picture I have of it. It was, we were looking for Cory Bustard. Well, actually, no, well, we had a secretary bird on a, the Cape Town leg of the trip. It was really far away. I didn't get a picture of it. Kept on walking back behind this brush. Uh, but it was definitely Secretary Bird along with Cory Bustard was the bird I wanted to see the most. And, um, and so it was a kind of anticlimactic for me while I was so focused on trying to find Cory Bustard that I saw a bird out way out in the um, distance. And I was like, at first my mind was like, oh man, maybe that's the Bustard. But then I realized, oh, that's the Secretary Bird. And I was like, oh, I really want to see a secretary bird, but it's not the Cory Bustard. <laughs> so in a way, it was kind of anticlimactic. It was kind of far away, but here, here's the picture I got of it. If I can, can you guys see that? It was so far away, but that's the secretary bird. Uh, I think I have one more picture. Yeah, very <laughs> not in focus picture because it was so far away, but we did get one. We didn't see it eating any snakes, but we did sit with it for a while. Really enjoyable. That's so cool. Um, definitely one of those species you <laughs> talk about for a long time after seeing it. Yeah. Um, let's see, Mary asks in the chat, what camera lens do you use? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't have like a really special camera. I just have a, a cane, it's called a, um, Canon PowerShot SX50. So um, it's got a pretty long lens that gets out there pretty well. I don't know. 
I don't know all the functions of it very well. So I just kind of put it in automatic and just go for it. But it tends to work okay for me and ended up getting some cool pictures, much better pictures than what I got of the secretary bird for other stuff. Um, but yeah, um, Judy, one of the participants on the trip, she had a much better camera and got much better pictures than I did. Look, look can I just interrupt one second? Hi, uh, this is Liv. Oh, hey, Liv, how are you doing? Thank you so, so much. This is bringing back so many, many memories. As you know, we lived there for a long time. And uh, the secretary bird is called a secretary bird because in your picture, you can't see it, but they have these feathers that come up and it yeah. looks like, a, like almost like the Statue of Liberty, you know, the crown, mm. spiky, and they're feathers, but they call them the secretary birds because the feathers look like pens. Yeah, so like, like a yeah. pen always has a you know a secretary. The always. feather on top of the pen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, 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 yes. We that's got to see funny. it kind of put its crest up a couple times, but I just wasn't quick did enough you, to get the picture. Did, did you see the hoopoos? Yeah, we had hoopoos too, and I learned how to say hoopoo because I was calling them hoopo for a while. Hoopoo. We saw uh, hoopoo. African hoopoos, and we also saw green wood hoopoos. Um, both of which are pretty vocal and uh, really interesting birds. Hey, I actually see Judy is on the call with us too. So I'm glad Judy is with us too. Lots of all of our participants coming on the virtual talk with us. That's good. It's very nice. Thank you, Luke, for doing this. All right. Um, Luann asked if you saw a hammer cop. I don't know what that is. We, yeah. Oh, I'll show you. Or, yeah, this is a good lesson for you, Kirsten. You got to know what a hammer cop is. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let me share my screen. Hoopoos and, um, and hammer cops. <laughs> uh, so not red chest and fluff tail. Let's change that to hammer cop. So uh, I think it maybe Suzanne, or I can't remember who it was, got a really cool picture of a hammer cop uh, from like a looking down below we went on this one little bridge and we looked down at the bottom of the bridge and there was a hammer cop that was sitting right there at the bottom of the bridge looks like it's ebert is not loading it for me oh there we go whoa so here's a hammer cop really weird looking bird it's got this huge head weird looking like its neck kind of comes at a point a little bit, like a real skinny mm -hmm. neck, a kind of a heavy brown body there, uh, kind of tied to water. So as you can see on this one, um, they um, prefer to be around water. They got these really big uh, nests that they make. I don't know, oh, here's a, here's a picture of the nest. So uh, wow. we did get to see one of the, uh, an old nest, hammer cop nest, um, but they make these huge, huge nests. And um, we didn't get to see a whole lot of hammer cops, but um, enough of them to whet our appetite for maybe more in the future. Look, can I, can I interrupt again one second, please? In South Africa, they pronounce it hammerkop, and it's uh, Afrikaans. And if you look at the bird right now, the previous picture was actually better to see it, but cop means head in Afrikaans. The ah. other one, previous, previous to that, where the head is sticking out a bit. Uh, yes, yes, very good. So there look at the yep. head and the bill. And now hammer, hammer means hammer in English. So think about it, his head looks like a hammer, doesn't it? So it, it looks does. like a hammer in your hands. So that's, 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 that's where the name comes from. Yeah. So here's the thing with birds in Africa. They are really weird. <laughs> so I don't know if like someone coming from South Africa, coming over to the United States, if they would think that our birds are so weird. Uh, but definitely going over there. Well, I guess their, their mammals are pretty weird too. When you think of like giraffe, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, like there's something about the wildlife of Africa that is uh, it's just mind boggling. Like, why is this bird shaped the way it is? Why is this animal 
have this type of body structure because like and, and then you, then you get into the habitat where they live and you can begin to understand why a little bit why a giraffe has such a long neck why an elephant has a trunk how they're able to um, move around in that habitat and get to the food sources that they eat it's just amazing absolutely that's so cool um there was also yeah. a request in the chat to share your eBird the trip report um which yeah you, yeah let me get that i was gonna say i can also put the link in the follow-up email so everyone can access it from there as yeah well. yeah we'll do both so I'll, I'll put it here in the chat let me let me grab it here and then putting it in the um in the follow-up email would be really good as well let me copy uh, so here's the thing guys is that um I think we'd like to do this again at some point. Maybe South Africa, maybe a different country, uh, different uh, different places. Um, there's something really special about enjoying a new location mm -hmm. with people who you know and have a similar um, understanding. You know, we come from the same place. Like everyone who was on the tour has some sort of connection with Tucson Audubon. So we could talk about Tucson Audubon related things to it. So like when we were there with the penguins and looking at the homemade burrows, we could kind of talk a little bit about, hey, think about what they're doing here and how that relates to us creating habitat for Lucy's warblers. And, you know, well, here's a uh, invasive plant that South Africa is working towards eradicating. Well, how's Tucson Audubon doing that? The same sort of thing here in Southeast Arizona. Um, and then, you know, we just kind of, it's just really cool to be able to experience this with, um, with your, with your, quote, with your family, with your community, um, rather than, you know, if you're going to go on an international trip somewhere and you're going to be with a bunch of strangers, that's one thing. But if you can go with a bunch of other Tucson Audubon people, um, and then a portion of what we, Bernie Ecotourist did for this is that, um, uh, a portion of, the uh, the fee for going on the trip, part of that also went to Tucson Audubon uh, to help us with conservation efforts every year. So it was uh, it's a pretty cool experience and be able to do that with uh, other folks from Tucson Audubon. It was great. Absolutely. Tina, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to Costa Rica in two and a half weeks. Oh. Um, <laughs> speaking of going to different places. Um, and I wanted to do a trip report. Is there a description somewhere on the eBird website how to do that, how to make a trip report? Yeah, I can just, uh, it's, it's fairly easy. Uh, just touch base with me okay. uh, separately, Tina, and I'll, I'll help you figure out how to do that. Um, okay, great. Yeah, it's, it's pretty easy pretty simple and it's really cool because like you can um you know you know I'll share share the screen cool you can see like all all the different like the route that you took and everything and, right. and then when you go down you can see these are all the different species that we observed and how many we saw that ended up on Ebert's list so you can see we saw crew buster just one time Red chested fluff tail just one time, spotted thick knee, but then we had a thousand eighty four little swifts, <laughs> and then you can yes. go back to and see all the different checklists. Now, uh, this is the one. This is just one that I put together real quick. Judy actually put together a better one with more photos. That um, actually, I should probably grab that one. It was has all of Judy's photos, which are amazing. Um, but it's really easy to do. Okay. Um, I'll shoot you an email then and you can yeah, explain yeah, it definitely. to me a little bit. Yep. So, so thank you. Yep. Oh, well, it looks like um had a couple questions about rollers, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> but we did we saw um two different species of rollers. We had purple rollers just a couple times. It was actually the very first roller we had in Kruger. And I was like, oh, wow, we're going to see a lot of purple rollers. Uh, no, we only saw two of them the whole time. But we had a lot of lilac-breasted rollers. So 
I'm uh, searching for one of my pictures. I could just show you one from, from eBird, but I have one one here. Um, <laughs> I'm just looking for a decent one. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, let me get back to there. Share screen. All right, the lighting isn't really good, but here's here's lilac breasted roller, a couple. So you can see so much color. And this doesn't even do it justice because the lighting is bad, but you got purple on the throat. You got this really beautiful blue, mountain bluebird type of color on the belly and this huge long tail that kind of goes out. Not, there's, there is a roller called a racket tail roller, which has even longer tail, but lilac breasted has a long tail that kind of flows out and then some grayish color. And then when they're flying, holy cow, the, the color comes out even more when it's flying around and it gets its name roller from its flight pattern. It's got a really distinctive flight pattern as it goes around. Such a beautiful bird, wow. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, the two of you who put that in the chat, <laughs> I would never have known what that looked like. Um, <laughs> okay, and then leave asks if the, oh gosh, how do you say that bird again? Araman. Oh, Aramamala. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, Ar <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's spelled uh, here. I'll spell Aramamala. I think that's right. Um, are they in the warbler family? Um, I just well, looked in my book. I just looked in my book, and um, it's it looks like a warbler. That's why I was just curious. Yeah, a lot of the warblers that we saw were. We saw a lot of different types of warblers, many of them brown. <laughs> so oh. uh, a lot of brown warblers. <laughs> um, here, I'll let's go to uh, show, go back to Aramamala. They uh, look yellow. Let's see, we had, I believe we had. Oh, so many. I think we had yellow rumped Aramamala. Okay. So, oh, kind of similar to a warbler, but they, uh, you can see maybe a little bit, I don't know, it's bill is a little bit stumpier mm -hmm. than I think most warblers. Like, they don't have wood warblers or the types of wood warblers that we have. Oh, they don't. In the States. But there are old world warblers and leaf warblers that are kind of similar. And oh. Aramamala is a totally different family, but they're that same sort of size. Um, uh, according to Wikipedia, Aramamala is, are in the Cysticolidae family. <laughs> Cysticola. Which, <laughs> which uh, was, the genus was previously placed with larger old world warblers, but they were broken into several families. Yeah. So they're oh. no longer considered. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's Aramamalas, and then you, you brought up Cysticolas. So might as well talk a little bit about Cysticolas. Um, we saw a lot of them. And here, I'll just show you. Um, uh, let's go to the valence. Just take a look. This is one that we saw. This is probably the, the best looking of all the cysticolas that we had. Um, Sue or Diane or Judy, if you're on the call, I don't know if you did as well, but I kind of got tired of cysticolas a little bit. Oh, really? <laughs> cysticola, cysticola. Yeah. <laughs> We had a lot of cysticolas, uh, and they're all kind of like brown cysticola. Yeah, so uh, the, you can see all these different types of cysticolas come up here. Tinkling oh. cysticola, wailing cysticola, oh cheering cysticola. So a lot of them are named uh, based on their um, the sound that they make. So piping, croaking, and so. Oh. Uh, many of them are, are really um, similar, and you have to differentiate them based on the sound that they make. Uh, well, this so, one, this one for sure, is called because Le Vaillant is French and it means brave. 
Mm. The brave cysticola. So. Here's wing snapping cysticola. So we yeah. had we had plenty of cysticolas, and uh, you all should be thankful that we don't have cysticolas in the states. I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that question. No, that's all right. Judy, do you agree with me? Yeah, she's got a couple, see a couple of thumbs up there. Yeah, those are tough. very interesting. Very interesting. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for your questions. Thank you, Luke, so much for that fabulous presentation, sharing your photos and fun memories. We will definitely include that eBird trip report in the follow-up email so you can peruse at your leisure and see all of the 400 and, was it 400 and? 413. It will, 413. so don't, you, um, Kirsten, I'm gonna give you Judy's trip report because it oh. has all Judy's pictures in it and it's it's a, it's a better report. So don't send it out until I send that one over to you. I just gotta grab it. That sounds good. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for joining us, spending the afternoon with us, uh, and hopefully we'll all see you on a international excursion sometime in the future. Thank yeah, you, you might we... see some of those coming pretty soon. How, how do we find out about these international excursions? Oh, that's it's... a good that's a good question. I'd be Leif. interested. I'd be so uh, you'll see them being announced in uh, Tucson Audubon emails. You'll see <laughs> them up on the filter page, and. Um, Probably there, there's a, well, if one gets put together, what, what we'll do is anyone who's signed up for this virtual event will give you a, a little oh, um, great. specific great. email to let you know that there's one coming. Uh, just uh, assuming that since you signed up for this virtual event that you might be a little more interested in doing that. Um, so we'll make sure you all know when, the, when that's put in place. Excellent. Thank you very much. So that would be the Tucson Audubon organizing it? So it's Tucson Audubon partnership with uh, different tour companies. We actually did one earlier this year as well with Naturalist Journeys to Trinidad and Tobago and Jenny McFarlane and, uh, was on that tour. Uh, so we partnered with Naturalist Journeys, uh, partnering with Birding Eco Tours. And so they put together the whole thing and we are just, um, uh, it's just catered to us. And so they yes. put it together yes. for us. Right. Very um, nice. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. All cool. right. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank no, you so no, much. We'll wrap Thank, up. You. Thank you all so much. And we uh, hope you have a good rest of your day and hope to see you again soon. And you will send a recording? Yes. Because I missed the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. So Bye. 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 See you guys later. Bye.